Welcome to The Art of Hunting, a podcast that explores the world of wildlife art through the eyes of one of the industry's most talented creators, Ryan Kirby. So whether you're a fellow artist, designer, hunter, or simply someone who appreciates the beauty of the natural world, join us on The Art of Hunting with Ryan Kirby and discover the passion and dedication that drives him. Like we need super- to set up a deal where he can tattoo. He's like the officially licensed uh, tattoo artist of my sketches. Yeah, compared. To, <laughs> yeah, we get hit up all the time on that. People yeah. want their tattoo. People want my art on tattoos, and I'm fine with it. Um, I just ask that they credit us on social when they post a pic. But right. yeah, yeah. There's That'd just some. Cool. You just got to make sure. And your artist, if you're a per- like a young person that wants to get a tattoo, just make sure your artist like looks at the art too and it's like yeah that would be a great tattoo because yeah. some some images some pieces aren't going to look good on your arm or yeah. on your on your skin they're just not so make sure you find somebody that'll be like honest with you about it well and that that's what i tell people too that want tattoos it's like look you can take my sketch in there but they're the artist like it's kind of like when people bring me a reference photo and want me to paint it like that tattoo artist has to be talented and do their own thing. Like, exactly. And that's what... Use my sketch, but it ain't going to guarantee and, anything. Yeah, and Colin said, too, like, he had a guy come in, and this is typical of, like, college students up here that'll come in and be like, I saw this on Pinterest. I want this exact tattoo. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that tattoo artists don't want to copy yeah. some other artist's work. Yep. They don't want to do that. Yep. They're an artist, so they want to do their own thing, throw their own spin on it, and they'll have recommendations. And he said that this person was like, hey, I want this, I want this, I want this. And he's like, I can do that, he said, but it's not going to look good. Mm -hmm. That color there isn't going to look good. It's going to throw everything off, or this isn't going to look right. And so he's like in the middle of doing it, and the person, or he finishes what and did exactly what the person wanted and then the kid was like i want this color here and he said no i'll do it he said but it's not gonna look good and so he did it and then the kid was like oh yeah you're right it didn't look good <laughs> and he's like i told you and so you like can't erase it yeah you i mean you can but it's yeah expensive. it's expensive <laughs> yeah. but like it's just do your research have a consultation with your tattoo artist don't mm-hmm. just and don't go in there drunk or whatever and be like i just want this they a lot of times they won't do that yeah the paperwork i signed at noble two said i um i currently am not under the influence of drugs or alcohol like uh, they won't do it if you're drunk or high or whatever that's cool it's a good Hmm. shop yeah it's a good shop so Noble, you should sponsor Ryan Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they'll sponsor. Maybe or we can a sponsor deal y'all. Whatever. Yeah. We need like a, yeah, a yeah. little relationship. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though. It looks good. Thanks. Did good work. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do an episode on new products. Speaking of new, like Madison's tattoo is so new, it's like wrapped in the little... It's called Saniderm. 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 Yeah. Saniderm. Like days old. Um, but yeah, we, we've released some new products and have all kinds of, uh, products and, and brands I've worked with over the years. So we're going to talk about that today. Sounds good. I know a lot Where of you people start, are excited. Mad Dog? Hmm. <clears throat> I don't know. We launched the lab poster. Lab poster. Yeah, we are. We're, um, if you're watching on podcasts, it won't make sense. So check out our YouTube channel, <laughs> shameless plug, but we're kind of set up like, uh, like a, um, uh, late night infomercial type deal. <laughs> like we got products laid out everywhere. I yeah. feel like Phil Swift, the flex seal guy, like buy this and I'll throw in this. seven more for 1999. But know? wait, and a free there's knife. more. Oh, there's always more. <laughs> um, but <coughs> excuse me, we, we have launched a few new products and some of these are just resized, tweaked a little bit. But people rarely understand what goes into launching a new product. And so we wanted to talk about that a little bit, too, because uh, our whole crew went and did a press check with our printer this past weekend, which was really cool um, for everybody to see. But there's a lot of behind the scenes that goes into it. There's a lot of technology, a lot of people that go into it. So we're going to kind of roll through some of that stuff. Um, 
But yeah, we just launched a brand new Labrador Retriever poster. This features um, a lot of my sketch art that we used on the Labrador Retriever print, but it's more of a, it's an 18 by 24. It's on thinner poster paper, which our heavier prints are on a, a much larger archival, um, kind of a satiny, uh, heavier paper. So one of the things that we have tried to do over the years is have products at different price points for different people. Um, so that's one thing that we've got here. The posters at a lower price point. It's what you would typically um, expect out of a poster type material, but it's really well printed. It is not signed or stamped, uh, which the paper prints are. And um, so, yeah, just something new uh, for the lab lover and at a different price point. People can decorate their hunt camp or whatever they want. Can we go a little bit more into the difference between the poster and the archival paper because of course we get a lot of people that think these paper prints are uh we yeah. think these th think that they're like posters and they're yeah. not yeah <laughs> spam <laughs> let him talk to the floor <laughs> uh i just dropped my phone it was ringing on silent um so, yeah, well, one of the things is the materials. So, let's start, we'll start with the press printing process. This one here, the posters are printed on a digital press, which the process is a lot like your, your, um, like your, your, your digital printers that a lot of people think of, where, you know, it goes through a printer, it feeds through, and it's printed digitally. Um, and then what they do is they crop it. So the, the posters are printed um, on a m way more lightweight, uh, glossy paper. And it, it really is a lot what you would expect a poster to be like. It'll roll up fairly easily. It's white on the back. On the, the prints, the way that these things are, and people on YouTube will, will enjoy seeing this part, the um, the paper prints are printed on a much heavier paper, much more heavyweight paper. So you can see it's it's way more sturdy, it's way more durable. It's archival, so it's designed to hold up over a long period of time, and um, it's it's got a little bit of color, a little bit of a natural color to the front and back. So the paper that we choose is really important. It's got to print well. I want it to feel good. You know, I want it, I, there, there's I want all of, of, of your senses to come and play here when you purchase a, a print of mine. So I want it to feel good. It's got a nice finish, prints very well, holds up very well. It's not shiny. There's no glare. But the process is way different on how they do it. And what they actually do for these is in the printing process, you have four colors. You've got uh, black. You've got yellow. You've got magenta, which is like a red color, and you've got cyan, which is a blue. And those four colors make up CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. And that is how all of all, all printed pieces are printed in CMYK color space. And what you do is um, they burn plates. So they will, they will actually use like an acid. We, we submit the art to them. And they do color separation. So they'll separate, okay, the, this part of this print is yellow, this part is cyan, this part's magenta, this part's black. And then they will burn a specific plate. So there's like a metal plate that is for the yellow ink, a metal plate for the magenta, a metal plate for the cyan, all that. Then they run these through, and, and we'll have Zach throw up an image of the printing process. The The printer that these things go through is like literally the size of a of a... Uh, a, a shipping container. I mean, it's it's a it big, it's huge. It's, <laughs> I don't know, probably 30, 40 feet long. Um, and it's like two stories. Like you have people walking up on the top of it. It literally is probably about the size of a shipping container. Paper goes in one side. And then the, the, the paper is run under the yellow plate, then the magenta plate, then the cyan plate and all that. And so what that allows us to do is adjust the colors individually. So 
once these four plates print on top of each other, they produce a full color image and they come off like this. Like this is, this is an actual press sheet that we took from the printer and they will bring one out. They'll print off the first one. And th these machines are like scheduled. So when we are ready to go, they say, Hey, Friday at 11 o'clock, you guys are on press. So our whole crew got up. It's a five hour drive to Richmond to Worth Higgins. And we got there and they were ready for us then. And they will bring out uh, the first press sheet. And I looked at it. And what we want to do is like, I want my waterfowl prints to match the growth and maturity print. So in, in background and color so that people can hang the two side by side and they form like a set. And it was a little bit too yellow, like right off the bat, had a little bit too much sign, a little bit too much yellow. So I say, you know, let, let's take the yellow back 15%. So they take it back to the press and this guy has a huge digital setup. So he's, it's really cool. And again, we'll have Zach throw up some video over the top of his setup, but he can adjust um, the, the, the colors independently. So he just reduces the amount of yellow. They print off another one. I'm like, ah, it's not quite right. Let's take it down a little bit more. Another 10%. They bring the another one back and it's, it's perfect, flawless. So at that point they have the levels, they have the color profile plugged into the printer and then they just start cranking off print. So they have our paper loaded, our ink, our plates and everything. And we have a time slot with them where we're going to print. So that's how these come out and they come out of the, the printer just like this. And then they will go through and uh, they'll crop them down, package them up, bundle them up and ship them to us. Um, and then we'll inventory them here and then sell them from there. So our whole crew got to see the, 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 the total uh, printing process and it's very involved. The thing that I tell them, we end up proofing these things, you know, seven or eight times because once you have the final uh, plate, it is a metal plate that is burned. So if we have a if we have a spelling error, you have to throw all that out and start over. Like you can't with this printing process. Once you're on press, you can't change that stuff. The only thing you can adjust is color, shift the color. So there's a lot of upfront setup cost, and so literally, when we get to Worth Higgins, by the time we're at press check, if we want to change one letter, it's like two grand. And we have to start over. We just go home for the day and then have to come back when we do it. So we put a lot of effort into proofing everything ahead of time before we go to press. Yeah. So it's not a poster. <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah, it's a completely different process. People, a lot of people think that, like, I don't know, I'm just sitting here and I have my HP desktop printer and I just hit print and we just start selling these things. But it is, it is way more involved. If you want to do it right, if mm -hmm. you want to do it high quality and you want to do it right, this is it. Um, you know, a lot of times, like in this day and age, there's a lot of like online printers and, and just you can get anything printed on anything these days. Yeah. But the quality is usually crap. And I'm not hating on our posters. I like our posters. I think yeah. they're great. Posters are great. It's just, I'm just trying to say, the paper is different. <laughs> the, everything is different. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and like I was saying, like a lot of the fly-by-night online printers that you can get one off or drop ship, the, the product is just crap. There's no, there's very little quality control. And these products here are ultimate quality control. Like crazy, we go to crazy lengths to quality control this stuff. Um, and yeah, the, the the posters are just a different different price for different people and that's why i feel like you're so hesitant about doing any sort of drop shipping <coughs> too is because you like to have us monitor it make sure it's like yes. quality, and make sure the customer's getting quality mm -hmm. things i look i look at everything we do as a potential touch point for a customer and you never you just never know when like that thing you produce is the first time a customer's ever going to experience your work your brand your anything and if it sucks, man, you just, you might lose them. It, it is, um, this, this, I look at these as a first impression and, and, you know, they say you can't get a first impression back and you got to make a good one. So, um, our products are my first impression for the most part. And I want to make sure they're good. I think that's why we're, I don't want to brag, but I think that's why we're like, 
I'm just going to say it. We're better than everybody else. <laughs> about that. But, <laughs> but you see, um, you know, like we've talked about in the previous podcast before, um, you know, we have knockoffs. We have, we've had four knockoffs pop up and they're crap. They're just, they're, and you know, they're ripping people off, which pisses me off. But, um, yeah, we have people complain like, Hey man, I, I thought this was your work and I bought it from China. It's, it's always some crazy URL. Like, yeah. Zibadoo.com. I, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's like, and it's like, did you really think that you were going to their website and like buying my work, you know? Yeah. And, and the product comes, it's broken. There's no customer service. You can't read the type. You just, it's, it's just garbage. And, um, for some reason people think that they're, they're buying from us and then they reach out to us afterwards. I know. And I feel like, so bad, Sorry, dude, you didn't buy from us. But yeah, yeah. It's like, you didn't get it from us yep. and there's, I promise you, you're not, we're not giving it to other people to sell. No, <laughs> so. no, no, no. And, and again, the, the drop shipping, you just can't, man, we try really hard to have good customer service, quality stuff, make sure it ships right. And I'm just hesitant to to totally rely on someone else to do that for us. Yeah. So we don't do it till we find like the right relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm open to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and you just never know. And, and the other thing, a lot of times we, um, you know, we might be working with a nonprofit or, Hey, this is an important buyer. They bought repeat stuff. We want to hook them up with this. We're doing giveaways. And it's, it's really hard to rely. Like, we want to be able to have control of that and do it efficiently and, and, and sort of, um, you know, handle the whole process of it yeah. to do it well. Yeah. Well, and the reason we resize the waterfowls is so we can frame them now. So. Yes. Yeah, that's the big thing is w the other thing we try to do with all of our new products is make sure that they're sized in standard sizes so people can find their own frames easy if they want to do their own framing. Mm -hmm. um, we also offer our own. We have a couple moldings uh, that we offer. And the, the waterfowl for the longest time was a 24 by 36. And we've had a lot of people that want to frame it next to a growth and maturity print or a Grand Slam print as a set. And we haven't offered framing for that. And it's bigger than the others. So this one now is the same size as our other prints. So people could buy two and order them framed similarly or hang them um, symmetrically on a wall. Yeah. So that's why we did it. So there's that. Another thing that we've done is, is licensing with companies. And I don't license with just anybody. We, we choose people to license with that, that makes sense and that we, again... I don't want to partner with crap product, you know, so we make sure that we're working with brands and, and products that we like and that, that I feel like fit with us. And one of the big ones is, you know, if you've listened to previous podcasts, you know that I've done a lot of work for Winchester and Browning over the years. And we, this, a year ago, this fall, uh, we started working on the idea of using art on packaging which is really cool because I've done packaging before for Winchester without my art. And we, this, this was a big project. So again, I feel like one of the cool things we can do on this podcast is talk about the behind the scenes that goes into it. So when we first started working with Winchester, uh, they have an agency that handles a lot of their packaging. And one thing that they wanted to do was they did a lot of focus groups on, I mean, this is like bigger time branding stuff like, you know, Pepsi and Kellogg's and companies like that do a lot of focus groups and consumer s surveys before they launch anything. And one thing we did there is we were kicking around the idea of putting art on the, the boxes. And so I did a bunch of different styles of work. Some was really loose. Some was more black and white. Some combined a sketch and a painting together, blended together. And some was like full color art on the front. And what unanimously came back is people like the full color. So we have a starting point there. And from then I turn over the work. And a lot of times I'll manipulate the art to, to help the agency out, to give them a, a piece of art that'll work well on the cover or on the, the package. And then from there they'll produce it. So like this one here, 
this uh, deer season XP box, this was turn and burn, but I took the dough out so we could focus more on the, um, on the, the, the buck for the ammo box. Um, this is a new one. Um, this was called double down, uh, a piece that we took to see we, and mm-hmm. the original still available props, <laughs> plug. <laughs> little plug there. Plug. I can't throw in two originals on our infomercial yeah. deal though. So, but, uh, but that one was a, a piece that we took to see we, and I clipped the, the geese out and put them on a different background from a different painting, that mallard piece. Oh, so, uh, blindside has a similar background and one is mallards. The other is the, the geese. Uh, so, and what I'll do there is I actually painted these geese on white and then clipped them out, gave them to Winchester, and then painted the background in to finish off the original oil painting. So, and I will, I'll give you guys, Zach, a bunch of like stuff you can put over to kind of help tell the story visually. Um, PowerPoint, this one was an outdoor life cover that I had done years ago, except I changed a bunch. I took off a bunch of the non typical um, points in Photoshop and repainted the rack. Uh, so we have the same pose, but a different rack on here. This one is really cool. This one, you guys will find interesting um, after we left Worth Higgins. Remember they were talking about printing on metallic ink? Mm-hmm. Well, this box here Whoa. has a metallic ink Look to it. Look at it, yeah. So this is Copper Impact uh, by Winchester. And obviously the, the copper has a really cool um, you know, symbolism here. And this is a premium. This is one of their higher-end black box premium products. So it's worth it for them to go the extra mile on packaging and these metallic inks are a spot color there's also an embossing Mm -hmm. so there's a foil emboss you can feel that on there where the type is raised on it yeah so that's a that's a really that's that's a pretty expensive uh package design there so like these here are just basically printed on a cardboard carton yeah um these here have metallic inks they have embossing on them there's a lot of cool stuff there And this one was the slip. So this was a buck running across a river that I did years ago for the fall classic. Um, This one here, this is a really cool story. We did an earlier podcast about conservation and about working with the National Wild Turkey Federation. Well, the Turkey Federation is 50 years old now. And so this is a box of Longbeard XR and my go-to 12 gauge, three inch number fives (laughs) and um, mossy oak, it's, it, you know, mossy oak is a big partner there. So mossy oak did the, the, uh, the camo on the background and I actually did this package design start to finish, not just turn over the art. So this one here has Prince of the Pines, okay. which is a piece I did for C. We a while back. And this is one of the birds from sons of thunder mm. that we talked about last podcast. And again, this one has some embossing on it where the birds are clipped out and embossed. So they did a little extra special touch for the Turkey Federation. And so this is the, um, their 50th anniversary box. And we have a little write up on the back, uh, about the Turkey Federation. Uh, and I actually wrote all this copy. So like came wow. up with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And that's how I've, I've done it with them. So for this one, I kind of pitched them on a few ideas. They narrow it down. I gave them several options for turkeys and we go from there. Wow. I so. saw um, Outdoor Life. I follow them on Instagram. They mm-hmm. posted the PowerPoint box. Uh, oh, yeah. On Instagram. Yeah, the 400 Legend. Yeah. So Winchester's coming out with a new one themselves, the 400 Legend. Yeah. And um, they po- that's what they were posted on there. Yeah. <coughs> Is that one the Mr. Photogenic? Is that what you call that? Yep. Piece? Okay. Yep. I was like, I think it, that's the name, but I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, and, th- and that's one of the ways that I've learned how to launch new products ourselves is helping other brands launch their products and see all the behind the scenes, the back end. You know, we we don't go into like the uh, consumed, like, you know, you, you, you think about like all the taste testing. That was a big thing for a while. Mm-hmm. Like commercials, brands would do like taste blind taste tests on their stuff. Uh, we don't go into that kind of level. But we we research quite a bit on what we think would be popular to release as a new product, um, and we've got a bunch of new ideas coming too. Yeah, exciting things. Yep. So follow us on Instagram, mm-hmm. or social, or YouTube, and sign up for the newsletter. Yep. If you want to know when all this stuff's gonna drop. 
So newsletter will be the first one. Yep, you'll get an email. We'll probably blow up your email that week. <laughs> what? What? Uh, I'm gonna flip the script here, Mad Dog. I'm gonna ask you a question. What? What? Um, what have you learned since you since you've been here? I mean, you've kind of seen. I'm I'm sure Worth Higgins was eye opening. I'm sure some of the stuff is surprising that you've seen working here. Um, what have you learned about new products since you've been here? <laughs> Uh, so I, this is kind of a loaded question. It is. <laughs> I was thinking about this earlier and I like had an answer and now I don't remember what I was, my answer for it, but I've just learned that there's a lot of variety. I mm-hmm. would say you could go any direction with anything. And especially with all this stuff that we've got, like, and all like your past work. I've learned a lot about how you like to use even past work or even future work to kind of just use it with anything or everything. You like Mm -hmm. to use it in multiple places or and the value in that um, is like, how can I use this? Where can I put this? And that really has kind of helped me get better with, launching something or coming up with an idea like in our meetings yeah i like i like that where you're like i want to i think this would go good here and here and we can use it here too maybe or whatever like that so i've learned a lot just following you around (laughs) i'm like totally in a different kind of business mind i think that's cool i love that that's cool. I think we get a lot of people and a lot of upcoming artists, like we talked about in a previous podcast, they're like, oh, can you teach me this? Can you teach me that? I want to meet you and do this and do that. I don't want to speak for Ryan, but I feel like Ryan's always like, I don't want to just teach you that. I want yeah. you to learn. A, I want you to learn that on your own. B, yeah. there's other, there's a lot more to it than just learning how to be good at drawing or learning yeah. how to paint well and I've learned that too. Yeah. People want people. And again, it goes a lot. We did a podcast on how to create work that sells. And, um, a lot of artists focus so much on the craft and when, when, and and a lot of the artists that reach out are younger, which which I get they, and I was there too when I was their age, but you want to talk about how do I paint better? How do I draw better? How do I do this better? And, what you really need to understand is what are you going to do with that afterwards? Like, that's the thing. Like, you know, you can paint in a hole that no one ever knows about and have amazing work buried in a, in a cavern. And that's not going to help. You can be the best craftsman ever. It's not going to help you build a career. Yeah. So the one thing that I try to think about, and I, I have, have, you know, preached with you guys enough is, okay, if we do this, how do I, ki- how do we kill three or four birds with this one stone? Mm-hmm. So, how do we take this sketch and how do we use it in three or four different locations? Sure, we can do this painting, but I want to create a painting that we can, um, you know, potentially license or use on this product. But mm-hmm. I've also got the original to protect the seaweed. Mm-hmm. And how do we how do we do that? One of the biggest things is archiving everything. Mm-hmm. Like we have a huge Dropbox folder and we've got it worked out to where like, if I do a sketch at night, I just lay it on Madison's scanner the next day, and then she scans it high res, and we have it in a Dropbox folder. So that two years from now, if someone asks, hey, you know, do you have any German short hair pointer artwork to license? Well, we have five that mm-hmm. I must have done a long time ago, and they are scanned in a way that can work. Um, you know, if... if uh, if you don't have digital files, high quality digital files of that art, it's worthless to anybody producing a product or a licensee or anything yeah. like that because they, they got to have something they can work with. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. Um, you know, I don't, there are times when I'm like stressed and we've hit deadlines and I just want to do something creative just to do it. But for the most part, I just don't randomly pick and choose. Everything is fairly strategic. Mm-hmm. And even if I do lose myself and do something creative, there's a there's a point to it. And we archive it in the process there. And, so Yeah, and a lot of these boxes, like you said in that previous podcast, aren't these like years old work? Um, a lot of them are, yeah. Like, yeah. Probably the oldest one is the slip. And that's several years old. Mm-hmm. Um 
But you know, if if you do it well and you have it archived well and you have a good digital file, it doesn't really matter how old it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can use it anywhere on a brand new product, state yeah. of the art product. Um, and we have a, we have licensees that we work with. We have a, we have an El, uh, Elk Home as a group that we work with, and they've handled uh, tractor supply stuff for us. And I found that the sketches are really versatile because you can put them on different colored yeah. applications. So, um, <clears throat> you know, like, for example, this one, Prince of the Pines, has a lot of bright green in here. And we clipped this one out from the background, and I made a bunch of tweak, tweaks before we put that on the package. But if, if you have a, a large variety of colors, you know, a lot of your home decor items have to kind of fit a theme neutrals or neutrals are great you can go anywhere with them um and if you have a lot of wild colors a lot of different colors in there it can be hard to license that or produce a print of it because like a lot of women don't want that in their home you mm -hmm. know it's got to have kind of fit the theme yeah so um that's been a big part of it a big part of the learning process too and we use we end up using the sketches that i've done in multiple ways like the art that's in those prints and posters is used on the packaging that we that we use. It's used in the marketing collateral that we use, the bio cards um, that we use. So all that stuff is used across the board. We're like Indians. We don't let anything go to waste. Right. <laughs> <laughs> With the license and contracts, mm -hmm. so they... Sp Sorry, I had a stroke there. Um, if you, I don't know what happened. Um, my tongue like went. I don't know. Anyway, if they when they pick the photo or photos, the pieces that they like, yeah, um, they have like certain. There's like an exhibit A and exhibit B. What's the difference on, on in this that? particular contract? Yeah. yeah. So the way licensing works is. There's a lot of different ways you can craft it. We kind of have a general boilerplate contract, which is a certain percentage of the wholesale price of the product. So if somebody wants to put my art on their product, um, some companies are big enough, they sell wholesale. Like, for example, um, all your retailers at Bass Pro, they sell a product at a wholesale price, and then Bass Pro sells it at a retail price and makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, there's a, a percentage of the wholesale price of each unit sold and they pay a royalty to us based on that. Yeah. Um, you know, some, some, and if it's a large ongoing contract, it'll just be like quarterly royalty payments, uh, based on that. And the contract just renews over and over again. Um, Sometimes, you know, smaller, we have a lot of smaller companies that want to, they just want to know what they're going to pay. And, and we're that way. Like, I don't want to calculate a number of units sold and have to cut a quarterly check. It's just one more thing to do. So like with some smaller companies that have started up, what we've done is just, we've calculated how many units they're going to produce the wholesale price and they just pay us once because they, they really aren't set up internally accounting wise to process all that stuff and everything. So we've done that, um, with Winchester, they were a large, they've been a large client of mine for a long time and, and they don't want to do it either. I mean, it, there's so, there, the amount of skews are like the individual products. So like when you check out at retail, like that's a skew mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. Well, by the time you have, so we'll just take Longbeard for example. Um, Longbeard in 12, 12 gauge, three and a half inch number four five six. Twelve gauge, three inch four five six. You you might have thirty five skews on Longbeard alone, and and all of these together. Well, calculating how many units sold at a wholesale price and this and that and the other. And the other thing is it's not really the product. Like they're just licensing that for the box. It's not the ammo itself is the product. That box is going to get thrown away. A lot of our other licensees are like sign companies or apparel companies where the art kind of is the product. Right. Um, but it'd be such a pain to have to calculate how many units were sold off of this kind of stuff. And it'd be, it'd get really complicated actually uh, for all the retailers and locations they have. We just cut, cut a flat fee just a one-time price and there are different levels of exclusivity and and things that come with that so um so we scheduled this one where like their top tier stuff is is licensed exclusively for the box and they we don't put it anywhere else 
then some of these, they just want some art for the box. So um, they pay a fee to license it for the box. We can still use it elsewhere. And so you, you just really try to work with their needs at the same time. Like, obviously, I'm not going to give anything away for free. And we have that all the time. You know, people think, oh, this will be great, great exposure for you if you give us this to use. And what I have found about companies that say that is if they can't afford to license it, then they're not successful enough to provide the exposure that they're promising. Right. Okay. Like if you're not, if you can't pay us a royalty to license my art and use my work and my talent, and my ability, then you're not a viable, successful enough company. That's going to deliver all of that exposure that you think you're going to give us. We don't need the exposure. You know, my kids can't eat exposure. And I tell <laughs> people that all the time. It's like, dude, you know, I mean, if, and if you flip the roles, like, okay, let me sell your product for free and put my art on it. And they're like, Oh, we can't do that. Well, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, we don't do anything for free. We don't do it for exposure. We don't need the exposure. We, we're, we're doing other things to get the exposure. Um, but we, we really do try to help all of the companies that we license to, because I know that that company has to be successful and this product has to work and they have to make money if we want to make money. And that's how I approach it because like if it's not viable for everybody, if it's not a win for everybody, it's not going to work. They're not going to re-up the product. It's not going to be successful. And then we shoot ourselves in the foot going after that. So there, there's a company we're working with right now where we've set a, a low flat rate and promised a lot of exposure because I want the product to be successful so that we can go from there. Um, you just got to think long term on it. And I don't really get greedy with a lot of companies. You know, I mean, again, I know be because we sell our own products, you know, I know that that product has to work if it's going to be viable in the future. And so I want when when people license my art, I want that company to either sell more units because my art's on it or sell it at a higher price point because my art and my name is on it. And I know that I've got to deliver value to them if this is going to work long term. So yeah, we can make a quick buck uh, just by setting crazy, you know, restrictions and rates and all that kind of stuff, but they're not going to come back. And so I, I approach all this stuff long term from a long term building perspective. Do you have a certain way that you like pick which pieces go or like that you offer to like Winchester or I don't know, whoever other licensing companies that want to come. Yeah. It was Kim. Do I need to tell her to go away? No. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us alone. <laughs> um, so, so Madison asked, do you, do we have certain pieces of art that we send to people? Um, and my background again is producing this for mm -hmm. them. So I, I, I know that, um, I know inherently, Hey, I have these 14 images that will work. I've got 32 that are not going to work well for you and they're not going to be what you want. So we can whittle it down there. Um, I can, I will always, you know, give my suggestions and I think this would be cool. I think that would be cool. Um, here's what we've found. You could probably apply that, but ultimately it's up to them. Right. You know, they have the final say on what they choose. And the other thing is, you know, if I sign a contract, I'm going to honor it. So we have to be careful about, you can't license this one over here to this company for these rights and then turn around and do the same and backdoor them yeah. and license it to the other person. So we have to think through that as well. And sometimes companies want to come and license an image and it's like, no, Winchester already has it for this. And there's going to be some crossover there that we can't do because mm -hmm. the last thing I want is people barking up my tree because <laughs> the products got put side by side at Bass Pro Shops and, yeah, you know, it's they're got the same thing pissed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, you really do have to pay attention to that kind of stuff. And, and again, that's another side of the business that I've had to learn over the years. That like, hey you got to pay attention to this stuff if you're going to do it well. You can't blindly sign contracts and make promises to companies that you can't keep. Right. Are there, like, any contracts, too? So, like, an example. I know Turner Burns, like, a giant, mm -hmm. awesome piece, and it's super popular that we sell. If you're in contract with 
Winchester for that box. Yeah. Is there so, like any sort of guidelines that we can't sell that piece or is like, does that ever come up? Yeah. And, and you can, and, and, um, you also have to look at like, uh, segments and products. So for example, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'd have to go back and look at what we did with that one. But so for example, um, I don't know, say you're a, say you're a sock company. Okay. Random. I don't know how I, I don't know how I got, I don't know how I landed there. I literally right there, I mentally did like a 360 view of Bass Pro Shops and the one in Bristol has the outdoor section. You've got ammo, uh, bows, footwear, socks. Yeah. And I like literally went that direction. If I'd have gone to the right, uh, past the fish tank, we'd talk about camping gear. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, there's different levels of that where there's socks and then there's apparel in general, and then there's all outdoor industry and then there's everything. So a company might say, Hey, we just want this. We want the exclusive on this for socks. We don't care about t-shirts. You can use it on t-shirts. You can sell prints. You can do whatever you want. They might be more aggressive or their, their, their company might have future plans of doing more apparel. So they say, hey, we want to license this um, exclusively for apparel. So we can't do our own stuff, but we could, we could sell canvases and, and uh, prints. Um, you know, if, if, a, if an ammo company wanted to use it, they could put it on their box, but no other apparel. Mm-hmm. We'd have to tell that ammo company, hey, you can use it on the box but don't produce a t-shirt with it because so-and-so has it licensed for apparel. Or they can get real aggressive and say, we want the exclusive on this for everything. We don't, we don't want this image to be seen anywhere else except for our socks. And that's going to come at a price Mm -hmm. because I have to calculate. Again, we talked about using art for multiple sources, multiple streams. I have to calculate, okay, how much could we have made off of prints? How much could we have made licensing that to another company? How much could we have made, um, you know, anywhere else? And that company has to pay for the potential revenue that we're losing as a business as a result of signing an exclusive contract to them. Gotcha. So exclusivity comes with a, with a price and, and sometimes your bigger brands want that. Like, Hey, we want this and we want to be the only place that this is ever seen. Um, and, and you have to work out a rate for that. And the other thing is sometimes we say no. You know, I've been asked multiple times to, to license the anatomy prints or the growth and maturity prints. And that's kind of our deal. You know, that's kind of our look. That's our signature product. That's what we're known for a lot. And so I just don't allow companies to reproduce that. I've had multiple nonprofits want to come and reproduce the growth and maturity prints. And I just don't do it because it's like, no. Nah. You know, we, I've poured my blood, sweat, and tears into that a ton of time and money into marketing it and making it successful. And now, now companies want to come in because it's successful and it's like, eh, nah, (laughs) you know, I mean, they kind of, you know, they want to ride the bike after we've pumped up the tires and it's like, nah, we're going to keep that one in house. Right. But the other stuff I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with and I actually like it. I like I like seeing other companies successful because of what we can offer them. I think that's cool. Yeah. I definitely feel like licensing is kind of like um, where you just kind of, you said this one time where you you just kind of give them the piece and then let it, it starts making the money. Mm-hmm. Like kind of just, like you don't have to watch it. You don't have to yeah. deal with and, it. Yeah, and, and you have to have good licensees to do that. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to trust them. Right. And and in these contracts that you always have like a clause there that like if they don't pay, they have to open up their books to us. Like we can go to a company and say, hey, we need, want to see your records and my accountant is going to audit them. Mm-hmm. But if you get to that point, it's like I tell you, the relationship's pretty much over. Like yeah. you got to have something that's built on trust and good faith and a positive direction. And if you get to the point where you're calling your lawyers to handle stuff for you, it's pretty well over with and you right. never want to get there. So we try to vet things out and hold up our end of the bargain. Um, but yeah, you, you don't ever want to get to that point. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I don't know. I can't remember if Dave Ramsey said this or another 
financial guy was like, you want your oxen to make make the money for you yeah. while you're... Like, yeah, and a lot of people call that mailbox money. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as mailbox money. Like, they're literally... It, it's just like the growth of maturity. People would think that, oh, well, you license that to a company and they pay your royalties. That's mailbox money. Ain't hey, freaking mailbox money. <laughs> You've got hundreds of hours in that thing. Yeah. Like, no, dude. You're like, talking to biologists. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and everybody, you know, a lot of artists want to reach out. What's your career advice? How do you do this? How do you become a successful artist? And it's like, okay, you go all in for a freaking decade and then maybe you make it. That's how you do it. So, yeah. like... I, you know, if you want to call something, it, you know, if I produce something now that's taken me 10 years to get to and it's licensed, that ain't mailbox money. That's just helping to pay for the previous 10 years of getting kicked in the teeth. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, it ain't mailbox money. Yeah. Um, And so, y- you know, it is what it is. Yeah. But a lot of people think that. Right. <laughs> when we have a licensee, I like to kind of be a part of their product and their story and their 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 brand and their stuff. I because I feel like I've learned a few things over the years that can probably help them. And the other thing too is there might be blind spots that they're not seeing that I can say, "Hey, we could do this. We could do that. We could do this and that." I don't I don't really like the idea of we want these three sketches for our product. You know, right? Um, yeah, we'll do that. Like we can send you a royalty agreement. We can cast your check we can do that but i like to i like to help them and be a part of their their company i want to be more of a partner with them than just a a, a vendor if that makes sense yeah. so i was headed down to a a sales meeting for a company i was doing licensing work with and i stopped at the north lake mall in charlotte of all places i think <laughs> it's called north mall. lake yes it's yeah. so sketchy yeah it's I've pretty sketchy <laughs> <clears throat> but um, shout out to North Lake Mall. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I was uh, I was um, I was in Belk and I had to get like a button down shirt or something because like I, I just kind of wear scrubby clothes like a lot of times you know ripped up <laughs> jeans paint everywhere and if I go out in public to like professional events a lot of times I have to buy clothes for that or like pull something out of the archives you know um, <clears throat> so I needed a button down or something. I was on my way down, and it was like 9 o'clock at night. The mall was pretty much empty. You were in North and, Lake Mall at 9 o'clock at night? That's yeah. That's so scary. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't even think I was packing heat then. Oh, I'd God. Have, I'd have been a sheep. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> awful. So, but I'm walking through, and I'm walking through, like, the lifestyle um, uh, T-shirts and, you know, stuff like that. And I look over and do a double take, and I see – one of my paintings, a very recognizable painting on a very recognizable brand in the outdoor industry. And I was like, that's not good. Mm-mm. Like I, I was still fairly young in my career. And even I know like, yeah, that's illegal. <laughs> and I'm probably going to, you know, retaliate for this one. So I went ahead and bought a sample of it. I actually bought the shirt. Um, went to the sales meeting, touched base with my lawyer the next week. And they're like, yeah, this is a big deal. Like this is a big time deal. Well, what, what happens a lot of times is these bigger outdoor brands, they're not, they don't want to produce everything like a, like, um, well, for example, like a Winchester, they don't, they don't want to produce their own apparel. They just want to work with a company that produces apparel Mm -hmm. and hire them to do it for them. So, um, so this big company had just hired a third party company and, you know, they probably have a stable of designers sitting in front of their Macs in a dark room. Like I've always worked in. And a lot of times the designers don't know the hunting industry. So their boss needs a a whitetail shirt to present to the client. Well, they just start Googling stuff. They just start Googling images, you know. And I'm sure this designer found my work, didn't know any better. They didn't tell their boss where they got the art. Their boss didn't tell the client where they got the art. Client approves it. It goes into production and it's at Belk. So, and they produce a lot of stuff. Mm. Um and the way that it works is if if we have and all of my work I register with the feds with the uh, USPTO trademark office. 
And if you don't register your work and there's a, an infringement, you have to go through and prove that it's your work and all this back and forth. If you register it, though, it's pretty much a no questions asked. It's like, this is my bulletproof legal proof. I don't have to prove anything to you. I've got it registered with the feds. Yeah. We did with that one. And you're basically, you're entitled to, if, if someone rips off my work and I've got it registered, I'm entitled to all of their profits and, and legal fees and even more. I think you can go up to like 250 grand or something. Wow. It's pretty bulletproof legal protection. So my lawyer sent a uh, cease and desist to Belk to take the product down which that pisses them off. Right. So they send that to the, the outdoor brand, which pisses them off because now they, they you know, are embarrassed with their retailer and they're frustrated because they've got one more thing to handle. So they hit up the company that they bought it from and it just like trickles, trickles down, down from there. And um, I'm sure the designer got called into the boss's office and Jude. got in here full. <laughs> um, but the, 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 you know, obviously the company that produced the apparel, they have a legal team. So they reach out to my lawyer and they know that their back is against a wall and they, there's nothing they can do. Um, and they ended up, we ended up settling out of court, which you never want to go to court. That's a mess for everybody. It's expensive. Um, so they ended up cutting a, you know, cutting a five figure check for all of it. And what they do then is they have to turn over their, um, their sales records. And they say, here's the sales records. We've ceased production. Here's how much we've made. Let's settle up yeah. right now. And so they cut a big fat check for it. Um, but my favorite thing to tell Kim is like, that's the difference between me and you is I go to the mall and I make money. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. You go to the mall and spend money and I go to the mall and make money. But it, it that experience, um, it, it's so hard to keep your mind in a right frame of mind when you're getting ripped off like that. How does that make you feel as an artist? Like when you see, I know you get so angry, but like when we find ripoffs like that, but as an artist, does that hurt you or how does that like? Well, everybody will tell you is that, um, imitation is the biggest form of flattery right. copying, but that's a bunch of crap because it's not in this <laughs> sense. And even my lawyer is like, look, I know this sucks, but you have to realize you're doing good work and you're successful, which is why you're getting knocked off. Mm -hmm. That does, that's like a little bitty band aid on yeah. the wound, you know? Yeah. Um, it's frustrating. Um, the biggest thing is it pulls me away from new work. Right. I don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with this crap all the time. I yeah. want my mindset into producing new work for more people. Like, I really do. I want to, I want to, I want to use my effort and ability to, produce new work and yeah. you guys see how much stuff I get pulled into around here as it is. Um, then when you have legal stuff you have to deal with, it sucks. Yeah. Um, it's expensive for everybody. Um, you know, I mean, we have like a $20,000 legal budget every year just to pay a lawyer to handle all this stuff. And right. some of it we see back, some of it we don't, but, um, it, it's really, really, really frustrating. And the, the part that I have to fight as an artist is I get jaded fast on mm -hmm. it like i i literally <laughs> kim and i um i've been even into um like a farm and home store you know even the smaller ones mm -hmm. um and i walk in and oh there's one of my deer sketches on a t-shirt and we, you have to get that shut down mm -hmm. and so but like kim and i'll wander off in different parts of a store and I'll be like, what have you been doing? She's like, oh, I've been looking at clothes for Brooklyn. She's like, what have you been doing? I was like, I've been looking for copyright infringements. <laughs> and I'm serious. I, I walk through all the apparel like, oh, let's see if anybody ripped me off here or something. I got to shut down. And you don't want to be, you don't want to go through life that way. Like right. you don't want to go through every day-to-day -day life thinking who's tried to screw me today. And, it, and it's hard to not go there because you get jaded and it happens a lot and you get frustrated with it. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. Mm. I fight more my mindset than anything on Aww. it, on how to stay like positive and upbeat and moving into the future. Um, and the other thing that I've told people that have worked here too is like, look, this is successful. Knockoffs are coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to have to deal with that. But the more important thing is you need to be 
moving forward. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's there's a saying like the the I don't know what it is in law enforcement. I'm going to butcher this, but the first guy through the door takes all the heat, right? Like the first guy through the door is going to take the bullets. And there's a lot of things that we've done here where I'm the first guy through the door in the industry. Mm-hmm. And like all the prints and stuff that we do, nobody's ever done it before. So like I'm trying to figure it out, trying to figure out how to produce it, trying to do that. And then you do all the hard work to make something successful. And then you have a bunch of people nipping at your freaking heels, copying your work. And it's like, I'm the one that took the lumps. I'm the one that pumped up the tires and other people are trying to ride the bike. Yeah. And that's frustrating. Yeah, Very that frustrating. Is. And it can be hard to summon like the courage and the energy to keep going through the door, to keep being Aww. that guy that does yeah. the first one when you're, you're just kind of getting nipped at from behind. Being handpicked. And I have that happen all the time. Like, um, dude last week wants to know where we source our triangle shipping tubes and what's the price and how can he get them? I've had, I've had four or five artists talk about that. Where can I get these triangle shipping tubes? And I was like, dude, it's literally custom. Like Mm -hmm. I, I built it on paper from scratch, took it to a printer and said, can you make this for us? And we did it ourselves. And now you got people that want to just copy it, copy it. And, uh, you know, then that's frustrating. So, but I've always told people, you know, look at Yeti coolers. Okay. Yeti went through a phase there where they were the first ones through the door. And there's been how many freaking cooler knockoffs from Yeti. Yeti was the first to do something like a Tundra. Now they might not have been the first to build it, but they were the first to market it and produce it like they did. Yeah. <clears throat> how many knockoffs do they have? I can probably name 10 or 12 names off the top of my head that are knockoff Yeti coolers. Mm-hmm. You walk into Lowe's, any big retailer, Bass Pro, who's there? Yeti. Because they never stopped innovating. They never stopped pushing. They never stopped releasing new products. They never stopped pushing. And that's what I've told people is like, look, knockoffs are coming. We got to deal with that, but we can't stop pushing. Because if you, there's like two directions. You can turn around and go into the future and produce new stuff, or you can turn and you can like try to fend off people who are copying the stuff you did three years ago. Mm -hmm. And you can only go one direction. You can kind of fight them in the back, but it's more beneficial in my opinion as a brand to keep pushing forward, keep doing new products, keep innovating, keep growing, keep progressing, and just let everybody else have the scraps. Yeah. That's really inspirational. That was good. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. I'm learning to fly this plane in the air. Yeah. So, um, but it's kind of where we're at. That's a lot of stuff on product. Yeah. Zach's want me to ask about if people want to license with you, who do they contact? Who do you think? Me. Not me. Don't freaking talk to me. I got new art to do. We just yeah. covered this. <laughs> But no, we, we do. We're, we're looking for people to partner with and, and looking for people to license work. And um, they can contact Madison at RyanKirby.com. That's, I think you're supposed to point like, ting, yeah. like link below. Yeah. And then Zach puts the email address or yeah. whatever. But no, we, um, you know, like I said, we don't do it with everybody. Um, sometimes sometimes the, the, the contracts conflict. There's a conflict of interest there and we yeah. don't do it. But we absolutely are looking for people to partner with. Um, on on outdoor products and and we can help a lot and and again what i like to do is promote the product as well not just license the artwork we want to be we want to be more valuable to those companies than just a a deer sketch because there's a lot of people that can draw and paint deer and you know if you just want a, a cheap piece of clip art you can find that elsewhere but i want us to be able to to help sell and help promote those brands that we work with yeah well, that was a good episode. Yep. I liked that one. Yeah. That was good. That was probably our longest one. I don't know. No. It was good. Well, it's good. Catch us on YouTube, Instagram, social. I don't know. All episode the rest. eight. Yep. Episode eight next week is uh, on the growth of maturity. Oh, uh, yeah. Print. So Okay. If, we can talk about that. Yeah. If y'all are really interested in how that came to be and mm-hmm. more details on that. Come back next week. See you guys. Appreciate it.